we go back 150 years, bees weren't kept in the hives as we know them today. They were kept in whatever receptacles were available locally. And in the UK, a lot of bees were kept in straw skeps, woven straw for them to make a basket. And a swarm of bees would fly in, occupy that, build wild comb inside. Um, that's the entrance to the skep, and the skep will be set on a piece of wood, or perhaps a stone slab. Sometimes they were set into, uh, into recesses in walls, known as bee balls. The colony would be allowed to develop and during the course of the summer would gather honey. Then, towards the end of the summer, a hole would be dug in the ground, a fire lit in it and sulphur thrown onto the fire. The skep was then lifted up gently and carried and held over the, the fire. The sulphur fumes would go up into the skep and kill the bees. The honey could then be harvested minus the bees. The WBC hive, double walled, the sloping outer boxes protected, rectangular inner boxes, uh, give them some protection against the elements. Lovely looking hives, proper guard type hives. This one's in a serious state of disrepair, just advertises our honey for sale. Um, but not practical hives really, certainly not to move bees in. First two years, 1975-1976. Um, this was the only type of hive I used, I only had six or eight. Used to move them to the heather. Nightmare, really. So uh, I was only too glad to convert onto the single walled hives, which is what I use today. In 1851, an American clergyman, Lorenzo Langstroth, discovered the bee space. And he found that in a bee's nest, a gap of less than a quarter of an inch, six millimetres, would be filled with propolis. A gap greater than three eighths of an inch, about nine millimetres, though bees would build comb in. Where this has significance for us is that if we can maintain a gap in the hive of between a quarter and three eighths of an inch, the bees should respect that and leave it open as a passageway. The discovery of the bee space allows us to build frames of a certain size so that they can be put into and taken out of boxes as required. Well, at least that's the theory. And so in effect he invented the modern hive, the modern movable comb hive, as opposed to the skep, which was fixed comb. The combs couldn't be taken out of the skep. So, my stands come in two parts. Ridiculous really, but what happened was I used to just have two bits of fencing rail like that on the ground, formed a stand, and the hive went on that. And then one of the best bee farmers I know said, Trevor, you need to get your hives further off the ground. They'll never do any good that low down, and he was right. So rather than scrapping all my bits of wood, my bits of fencing rail, scrapping them and starting again, I left them in place and simply made a six inch box to stand on that to get the bees further off the ground. The floor I use is a simple tray. This one's actually homemade with a plywood base, just a rim round three sides, leave the front open for the bees to come and go. It's reversible. I run the hives, my hives with that as the entrance. You can simply flip them over and you get a much deeper entrance. I prefer the narrower entrance. To the floor goes the brood box, the bottom box. That's their nest, we never take honey out of that. The queen's in there all the time. She lays eggs, juices new bees, more bees. The bee space I mentioned is here. That gap under there is the bee space. You'll see they don't respect it completely. I've built some, some brace comb in it. And underneath, the combs should be flush with the bottom of the box. There. There. So base space is at one side of the box only. Some hives have the base space at the bottom of the hive, bottom of the box, My all mine, Smiths and Langstroth's, all have the base space at the top. If you had a base space, both at the bottom and the top, and you put the next box on, that was a bee space under there, in effect, in effect you would double that bee space and get brace comb. The bee space is also between the ends of the comb and the box, there. If that measurement between a quarter of an inch and three eighths of an inch isn't maintained, 
you can't get the combs out. They'll either stick them with propolis if it's less than a quarter of an inch or build comb onto the frames if it's greater than three eighths. The brood combs in the hive, I glued in, I glue everything in with propolis. That's a brood comb. The, the spaced by having widened lugs on them. So the frame has a wider shoulder in effect that causes the spacing in the hive. Again, the spacing on the end of the frames. These are all fairly new combs. As the bees lay generations, as the queen lays new generations of bees, eggs, the comb gets progressively darker and darker and darker. And after two or three years can end up completely black. There we have a dead wasp. So that comb's probably only built last year, I would think. That one maybe a year, 18 months in use. So at the moment in winter, that is the complete hive. We have the crown board on. And then the roof. As we go into spring and the population of bees is expanding, we uh, we have to give them more room for storing honey. So we put our queen excluder on. We've come across this piece of equipment before, just a grid. And again, we'll note bee space on one side only. Looks a bit big that, but that should be between a quarter and three-eighths of an inch, that bee space. The other side is flush. No bee space there. Bee space is already at the top of that box. That maintains the integrity of it. And then we then, as the summer wears on, add honey boxes. They can be anywhere up to six or seven on a hive, depending on how strong it is. I don't say that with any pride. If I was running the job, if I was running the job properly, all my stocks would be even. I'd probably have three or maybe four on. But I have exceptionally strong stocks, and some are exceptionally weak. Very a lot in strength. These these combs are also spaced with having wide sidebars, but they're wider than the spacing on the brood comb. These are shallower frames, there's a good reason for that. Some people use the deep boxes for honey boxes as well. A box like that when full can weigh 90, 95 pound, 42 or three kilograms perhaps. Uh, more than sensible to be lifting really. It's all right if you're young and fit, but uh, especially if you're lifting them above your head onto a pallet on a truck. So that's a honey frame, honey comb. That's our brood comb. Apart from the difference in height, you'll notice there's also a difference in the spaces at the end. These are wider. So we get 10 of those in a box. The same width box, you only get eight honeycombs in. The honeycombs can be spaced wider apart because there's no brood in them. The brood isn't hatching out from either side. And basically a thicker comb means more honey for every comb you handle. What's the relevance of that? On top of it all goes the crown board, the ceiling, the bee's ceiling. Those holes in traditional hives are designed for placing porter bee escapes in. Oh. Porter bee escape, designed by an Austrian watchmaker called Porter. I don't know his first name. Clever little devices, really. The bees go down through that hole. He was a watchmaker and he used watch springs past through the hole into there and then they walk out through there the springs open up and shut behind them meaning they can't get back through they work but they're uh, they're very slow not very efficient so i use a different method for clearing honey off getting uh, bees away from the honey boxes but basically you set your crown board up like that lift the box on top Leave it a few a day or two, come back and that should be clear. My preferred method of clearing bees is to use a New Zealand type clearer board. That's the underneath of it, and that's it from the top. Just simply a 
rim, the tray, walls drilled in opposite corners, and then those screwed on the underneath. They are basically half of this. So if you can see, take one of these and I cut it in half. And the underneath of them, the bees come through the hole into there, walk down through those triangles and out through that hole. And they don't come back in. If you're left on long enough, if you leave them on a couple of days, some of the bees will start to come back in. But uh, for a day, a day and a half, the bees will clear out. I don't use them in that manner though. I have a stand and I set a clear board up like that. And then put my supers on, my honey boxes on. Just tell you for demonstration purposes, but I usually stack them six, seven, maybe even eight high. And then I put another clear board on top like that. And I'll take bees from two or three different hives and just stack them together like that. Doesn't seem to be any fighting. And the bees come up, out through the holes there, and out and clear and fly back to the hives. Um, the arrows on the clearer boards were designed for when it was in use on the hive that way. And the idea is like a parcel, the arrow points up over, meaning that way up. The trouble is, once you get your honey boxes stacked like that, you can't tell if that board's the right way up. Equal thickness, flat side to side. So I put the arrows on so I can go along when I'm finished to sight and just check that all the clearer boards are the right way up. The arrow pointing up over. Um, because if you get them on upside down, get them on the wrong way up, instead of clearing, these come up from below and fill the boxes up completely. So instead of coming along and expecting maybe a couple of dozen bees left in a box, you can have thousands. So that was the reason for painting the arrows on, with the arrows pointing up. So I was pleased when I'd done that, thought I'd answered the problem. It was only when my daughter saw it, who helped me sometimes, and she said, why didn't you put the arrows in the direction of travel of the bees? So the arrows pointing up, the bees are going down. Fair point, really. And when we do them this way, well, the arrows pointing towards each other, because bees will escape out that bottom board as well if it's, if it's placed that way up. This way. As we get into the, as we get into the, uh, the middle of July, I take the last, I take any summer honey off and prepare the bees for moving to the heather. And when we move bees, we put a ventilation screen on. I sometimes refer to them as travelling screens, ventilation screens. Just a simple wooden framework, uh, I made these myself, uh, with a bit of mesh nailed on top. And that goes the top there and makes sure the bees have plenty of air during transport and don't uh, suffocate. I have moved them sometimes without a ventilation screen if it's a short move and I'm very quick and the night isn't too uh, too hot. You've got to move bees either early in the morning or late at night when they're not flying otherwise you lose all the flying bees. By putting the screen on it enables me to load them at night, leave them overnight and go early the next morning and tip them. That way I'm tipping them in the daylight, not worried about it getting dark. Uh, you've got to start doing these things as you get older and perhaps less agile. Crown board back on and then topping it all off is the roof. The telescopic roof which fits over the top and down the sides and sheds any rain. The basics of a modern Langstroth beehive. If you found this of interest, please click like and subscribe. Thank you. Uh, as a deterrent to theft, and beehives do get stolen, most years we get reports of hives going missing recently. Two or three years ago there was 40 went missing off one site. Um, so as a bit of a deterrent, all my equipment's branded TLS, Trevor Leonard Swales.